Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Francis Family Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John W. and F.E.E. Spees Memorial Trust, Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Mara Sailor. Welcome to a new season of Arts Upload from an old place with a new look and a new name. Yes, the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures to share more stories about the arts with you. We've got Disney and the Nutcracker. Also a poet with some advice for her younger self. Plus a barber shop slash concert hall. All ahead on the Upload. I'm just wondering, is Mickey Mouse as big in the Philippines as he is everywhere else in the world? Oh yes he is. We grew up watching Disney films and cartoons. We love it. Well the reason I bring it up is that earlier this week, PBS devoted two full nights to Mr. Disney's amazing tale. But even in four hours, they missed some of the ways a Disney footprint can still be seen around Kansas City. So producer Ashley Holcroft and videographer Dave Burkhart set out to remedy that. In a humble neighborhood near the heart of the city, a young man of modest means, not particularly good at drawing or animation, yet with an undeniable fire in his belly, would borrow a camera and in a garage on Bellefontaine, Walter Elias Disney would record his first motion picture, setting events in motion that would change show business forever. So, in remembrance of one of Missouri's most famous sons, we've decided to retrace his Casey footsteps with Disney aficionado Butch Rigby. Our first stop is Walt's boyhood home. It's the brown house on the right. They usually have Mickey Mouse ornamentation in the front. Yes, they do. They're very proud. You know, you hear and you read about all these great American business people that started in garages. Well, Walt Disney really did start in a garage, and he started <laughs> in a garage here in Kansas City. Really, it's an amazing thing to see this house still standing. Family has lived here for decades, and they're very proud of the heritage of the house. The neighborhood's very proud of the heritage of the house. But his time here was hardly carefree. As president of Thank You Walt Disney, Dan Beats can attest. Walt worked very hard while he was here in Kansas City. He had to get up every morning at four o'clock and throw the morning paper. And after school every day, he had to go out and throw the afternoon paper. And that was hard work for a little nine-year-old kid especially. His dad was a very strict disciplinarian and Walt knew there was no choice about it. I went back and researched what the weather records are for that first winter that he was here in Kansas City, 1911 to 1912. Well, it turns out that that winter is still the record holder for the year in which Kansas City received the most snow for an entire season, the most snow for an entire month, and the most snow in a single day. All those records still stand, so you can be sure he wasn't exaggerating. He was walking through snowdrifts taller than he was. And for folks who lived in apartment buildings, he had to go into the apartment building and put it at each, each subscriber's doorway. Well, they would have a nice warm radiator there in the uh, apartment buildings, and he would curl up on the floor next to the radiator and, of course, fall asleep. And then he'd wake up with a start, worried because he was late for school. He was late delivering the newspapers. And he said he had nightmares about that even when he was an adult. Those very classes he feared missing were held right around the corner and bear a unique distinction. The first art classes that Walt Disney ever took at what was then called the Benton Boulevard School, one day his teacher assigned the class to draw pictures of flowers. And so he drew his flowers with faces on them. And the art teacher corrected him and said, Walt, flowers don't have faces on them. Well, in 1932, Walt undertook the production of a film called Flowers and Trees. 
the entire film is about flowers and trees who have faces on them. And there's just no doubt that when Walt made that movie, he was thinking about his art teacher back here at Benton School. But before success became synonymous with his ventures, first he had to learn how to animate, and he did so in time-honored fashion. A very young Walt Disney walked into this building and checked out a book, Edward Morbridge on animation. He was filling the Saturday Evening Post. He said, you know, a library influenced all of 20th century animation because I didn't know how to draw cartoons. I read the book and read the book and then I made drawings. And a few years later, uh, some of us here from the not-for-profit Thank You Walt Disney uh, approached the library. We asked him how many books uh, had they purchased you know, of Moorbridge over the years. They said two, one in 1950 and one uh, predating 1920. And Sure enough, they did put it in special reserve collection. While studying the mechanics of animation, Walt worked for the Kansas City Slide Co., now the Crossroads Academy. You know, I love the fact that these very windows that Walt looked out of are still preserved within the building. This great light shows just what kind of a terrific art studio this was. And it was in this very building that Walt Disney and Ub Iwerks really made the decision that they could make a career and spend their lives in the animation industry. And hopefully it'll have that same influence on all the children going to school here at the Crossroads Academy in the 21st century. It was from this building at 10th and Central that Disney would make a huge creative leap. Once he was convinced that he knew how to animate drawings. He then left that job and founded the Laphagram Film Company and it located it at the building at 1127 East 31st Street. One of the single most important sites in the history of Hollywood animation. It is the building where Walt Disney learned his craft and taught others how to animate films. And of course the single most important historic event that occurred there was Walt kept a mouse as a pet. That mouse inspired him five years later to create what has become the single most widely recognized fictional character in the world. And you say he was just right up there. Well, Walt Disney right was on the uh, west side of the second floor. He had about 2,500 square feet. And we were able to prop up what was remaining of his office and save that. And the rest of it was collapsed in. Thank You, Walt Disney has been working diligently to preserve this landmark. But conservancy isn't their only aim. Their plan builds on the past for a stronger future for Casey Animation. The goal will be to reproduce the Laphagram offices as they would have existed in 1922, then to take the rest of this office and create a working animation lab with some historic things that the general public can come in and see, but also have a working digital lab in here so the next generation of creative artists from Kansas City can create some of that content right here. So a great man's legacy continues. To be preserved are the walls he touched, a pathway laid for up-and-comers, Missouri's beloved son, who braved the winters and the mice. Yet, when it was all said and done... If you had it to do over again, would you do any part of it differently? Well, if I had it to do over again, uh... I think, uh, no, I don't think it would. <laughs> Here in a place that speaks to everyone's inner child, we've got another poet to showcase with a poem that seems most appropriate. Jeanette Powers manages the Uptown Arts Bar. In fact, she's helped us find some of the poets we've featured so far on Arts Upload. But this week, Jeanette does the honors herself on a poem called Little Jenny Soup. Justin Bond is the producer and videographer. once asked me, what advice would you give to your younger self? Dear little Jenny Sue, remember how today you realized that with your imagination, you're completely free? That's not a question, it's a statement. Remember how today you realized that with your imagination, you're completely free. This is the most important moment of your life. It is the earmark by which you will hear everything that comes after. 
I see you in rainbow suspenders with a book on the playground. And I'm not going to give you one bit of advice. I'm not going to school you or whip you for my 2020 high horse. And the thing about it is, you won't let anyone else either. You are what we nicely call strong-willed, stubborn as a headstrong little girl. And anyways, Uncle Dwayne already told you, you ain't like them other cats. Don't let them scratch it into you. Little Jenny Sue, you are six years old and the world is right in front of you. You are curious as a nine-tailed fox chatting with a fat man under a laurel tree. You are bright-eyed as a first roller coaster ride, carefree as the first green leaf of spring. You trust the world so much. You leap from playground swings while blindfolded. You believe wings will burst forth from your shoulder blades and lift you skyward. You believe the fall will not be fatal, that you will always walk away unharmed. I bet it's all those books that taught you that. It's good you love the library. It's good you wrap your little ponies in shoestrings to play Tutan Kahaman. It's good you colored the sailboat instead of the butterfly. It's good you tried to brush the dog's teeth. You will hold that dog in your arms when she dies because your heart is overflowing with love. Little Jenny Sue, you are curious. You ride horses bareback. You talk to squirrels and they talk back. They say, you ain't like them other nuts. Don't let them crack you. And all I really want to say to you is this. Hey kid, keep playing, keep climbing trees, keep inventing constellations, keep winking at everyone, keep running around naked. You ain't like them other bananas. Don't let them peel you. And they're gonna try to. They're gonna try to put you in time out to send you to bed without dinner. They're gonna try to ground you. But today, you realized that with your imagination, you're completely free. Quick, what time is it? Um, doesn't really matter, <laughs> except that we're now a few seconds closer to December 5th, when the opening curtain will go up on the Kansas City Ballet's all-new version of the Nutcracker. Back in July, we started our coverage of this huge undertaking, a $2 million reboot of what's already a very successful tradition in Kansas City. This week, resetting the stage picks back up on the action with choreography, costuming, and a whole bunch of kids to boot. Outside, it's your typical hot, humid August afternoon. Inside the Bollinger Center, snowflakes, sugar plums, and holiday finery are what's on the minds of nearly 250 young dancers who filed through the doors. This is amazing. I mean, this is what it's all about. Come December, the youngsters chosen from these auditions will step on stage at the Kaufman Center and into the history books as part of the new nutcracker that Devin Carney is racing to unveil. Ya da de yum, de yum, de yum. Since I was a dancer, I've always dreamed of doing nutcracker and the, such an honor to be able to do it here. Two turns. If you're surprised to see the man in charge working this hard down in the trenches, well, you don't know Devin. Turn, cross, slap, clap, open. They are our future. Not only are they our future dancers, but they are our future audience members, and they are our future art teachers, and they are our future math teachers who understand what it's like to be a dancer because they did that at Kansas City Ballet when they were 12. Two, three, and four. Between now and opening night, that'll mean as much as 15 hours per week devoted to the kids in the company. Good thing Devin's got technology to turn to. That same iPad, which helped him sort through the casting crunch, also plays a key role in another important task, replacing the classic Balanchine choreography with movements of his own. I can look at something Tempe Ostergren did four months ago, and I can say, oh, okay, you did it like this. You know, I show it to her, and I actually can look at it while she's doing it, and I can say, oh, wait, no, you went that way, not that way, you know? And it's awesome. 
plie up and parare, parare, arabesque, susu, up. I knew I wouldn't remember it. I just, I knew that. And I knew the dancers wouldn't either. No offense to them, but you know, everybody's got a lot squished into their brain. When you're a dancer, there's a lot of steps that have to be in there. So, even as the snow corps de ballet works to master the patterns Devon envisions for them. One and two and sutanucha. Okay, we'll try that again. They're simultaneously learning another large piece. This is pedals. It won't be danced until May, but now's the only time its choreographer and stager could show them the steps. And there's even more, complete with sword play. Five, six, seven, eight. Between now and the Nutcracker comes October's production of The Three Musketeers, filled with the kinds of challenges that swashbuckling brings. If all this has Carney particularly stressed, he isn't letting it show. We're on pace. Everything is a process. It's rare when something actually gets built, sewn, or painted, uh, and the first time's perfect. Oh, well, not that long. That's Costume that. fittings, like this one with designer Holly Hines and maker Coco DuPont, both based in New York City, are a part of that process. Uh, a chance to see how what looks great on paper actually works for the dancers who will be wearing them. Feels great. There are certain moments in the Nutcracker that I call the ah moment, and we're counting on that. So like when a certain person comes out in Act Two, we know that we hope we hear the ah over the orchestra because they think it's the cutest thing they've ever seen. Just to give us enough room so we don't. Like her friend, Alain Vais, who designed the sets, Holly brings a world-class resume. Yes, Charlie. ABT, New York City Ballet, the Bolshoi, and on and on. But she says a chance to create something of this magnitude doesn't come along often. Hide a collar, okay? And much like the scenery, so many costumes are needed in such a short time, she's had to distribute the workload literally from coast to coast. We have 27 makers making the Nutcracker. And as far as I know, that's the largest amount of shops that have ever worked on the Nutcracker. One of those 27 sits just minutes away. KC Costume is where menagerie members like the Mouse King will be getting their heads on straight. It's a work in progress. Uh, yeah, there. We, okay. we dropped that one. Yeah. They're great guys over there. They're trying really hard to help me envision what I want. And uh, my assistant's really good at uh, crafts and knowing what the current best techniques are. And I'm sort of out of that world because I've been doing tutus and romantic skirts. Hmm. Okay. You don't want the head bobbling around, so it has to really be secure to their head. But if the minute all this is closed in around you, or if you have a big nose, as I've drawn big noses on the mice, if that's all blocked in, you can't see the floor, and you can't see your feet. This appeals to me. I need my dancers to be able to breathe. Number one, you've got to have dancers that can breathe inside these, these heads. So that was really great to have that chance to go over there. The costume designs are coming up off the pages and becoming three-dimensional, real objects that you can touch, they're tactile, you can feel, you see it on a dancer and see if it's gonna move well for the choreography I have in mind. It's no longer talk, and, and I really love that about the process right now, and it's so inspiring for me. And pirouette, développé. Great, okay, so let's do that much first. What's interesting about Devin's concept is that Every nutcracker he's ever performed in, or he's ever seen, or he's ever been a ballet master on, it's almost like he took little notes. Almost like he knew in his heart he was gonna do a nutcracker one day. All right, here we go. As the clock ticks down towards December, you can track more of the company's progress on our website, kcbt.org. You know, all those colorful sets and costumes have more than a little bit in common with this place which Mary Harris Francis and Barbara Marshall started in 1982. The Toy and Miniature Museum, as it used to be called, was closed for over a year while this grand old home on 52nd and Oak underwent some major renovations. When it reopened on August 1st, the count was up to 4,600 antique toys on display here. The world's largest collection of fine-scaled miniatures, and they are incredibly detailed, are now all housed downstairs. 
And don't forget about the giant sculpture made from keepsakes that Kansas Cityans donated to the cause. The Toy Tissery is out front to greet you in the lobby. Okay, we're changing gears now all together here on Arts Upload, finishing with a story that comes from upstate New York, one that mixes music and hair care. Yep, Albany is laying claim to a barbershop by day, contemporary music venue by night. Take a look. By day, we cut hair over here, and by night, we're transforming the barbershop into the barber lounge. We have live music going on. I come from a long line of hairdressers. I thought it was something I would like to try. I tried it out and it just really clicked. I guess it's more hereditary more than anything. It's right in my blood. I think 95% of the people that come in, they just want a little trim around the edges or something like that. But sometimes you have younger kids that come in and they want to be really, really edgy. And that's where the real creativity comes into effect. I try to give people an experience of really enjoying their time while they're here. I guess by default, I, I am maybe a part-time psychologist. I just don't have the degree to go with it, you know? Right. In the last couple of years, I've been very, very focused on reinventing myself as a hairdresser and as a musician, as a songwriter. And now I wanted to open up a place that I could have not just singers, songwriters, bands, spoken word people, I mean, anything that it was very expressive, very exciting, and very new. I have never found a place like that. I took it upon myself to do something a little different that I didn't think I'd ever do. Majesty, up now, up now and one of the most important things to me is that People that are songwriters, people that write or they're doing spoken word, they're actually being heard in a very intimate setting. How do we do this, you might ask me? Well, while the shop is closed, we move a couple of pieces of furniture around, put some rugs down, put the drums where they need to go, where guitars are gonna be set, get the cameras ready, get the sound sounding good, and also get the artists excited about what they're doing. So much to do, not enough time to do it. So much to say, not enough I got the idea when I was down in Nashville, because there were so many really unique places, and people were actually listening. They weren't like over talking and, you know, talking to their friends and being loud and stuff like that. I mean, they were really actually listening to these artists play because they really did have something to say. I have been to many, many places in the, in the area, and this is where my home is. So why not try to do something very similar to Nashville, but in my own way? Well, when the artist gets the opportunity to come and play here, we're going to record it for them. We're gonna videotape it, and it's also gonna have its own YouTube channel, which I think is really, really exciting. They get the opportunity to see it and you know, share it with their friends and get people really excited about what they're doing. The flames rubbing my body like a mother washing a dirty child. Turn around, I heard you say, as you help peel the flesh off my bones and wash away this illusion of grandeur. This is special because you get an in-depth look at the artist and you also get the, the feeling of where they're coming from when they're doing what they do. You're not gonna get that at a club. You're not gonna get that anywhere. You're not gonna get it at a coffee house. You're gonna get it here. And that's what our focus is. And I'm drowning in you. It's been left on sale. Seasons have grown dead. And there's nothing we're fighting for. We're gonna get the word out through my shop, also through Facebook and word of mouth, people that I have come in contact with over the years. I think by doing something like this, not does it always make me feel good, it's gonna make everybody feel fantastic, that they actually are giving back to what they do. And I'm giving back to them. You know, once on Rare Visions, I think it was in Madison, Missouri, we met a barber who 
cut hair and taught music lessons, yeah. and I even took one for the team. <laughs> That's not necessary this time, but we are out of time. Another arts upload is pretty much over. Next week, more dance on tap with the Kansas School for Classical Ballet, but as we close out, how about something a little more contemporary? The Hardline Dance Company is just getting started, and this terrific video they put together will give you a taste of what they're all about. From the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Marisa. Thanks for watching. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Francis Family Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John W. and FEE Spees Memorial Trust, Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.